Thank you, Dave. So, good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about JavaScript and web browser. So, for a lot of people, JavaScript engine is like the engine in your car. It's there, hidden under the hood. You don't get to see it very often, but it works all the time, or at least most of the time, hopefully. Uh, speaking about car, it may sound silly to you, but a few years ago, I hardly knew how to drive. Uh, as I moved to the United States, uh, California to be more precise, I bought my first car and I started to drive quite often. Now, I'm of course an engineer and I'm curious, so I really want to know what is there uh, that makes the car work. Uh, what, what is under the hood that uh, allows me to drive around the city? By the way, this is not my car, this is just a fancy picture. So one day I decided to know about it. And as predicted, of course, I didn't even know how to open the hood. So I have to call a friend, and he showed me which button to press, how to open the hood, how to check the oil, where to find the spare tire, and so on and so forth. Now, it didn't turn me into a car mechanic, but it was a very useful experience. And that's exactly what you're going to experience in the next 30 minutes. We're going to open the hood of web browsers and try to see the JavaScript engine and how it works. So there are two major parts in this talk. The first is really, really about the JavaScript engine itself how it works, how it consumes your code, how it interprets your code and runs it in its virtual machine. And the second part is, how does the JavaScript engine integrate with the browser itself? So without further ado, let's talk about JavaScript engine. Uh, really, the central piece of JavaScript engine consists of three parts. The parser, this is the part that consumes your code, assumes you have these two lines of code, and the parser will uh, parse it, and then produce a syntax tree, and then the interpreter will run that uh, code and do something for you. In this case, displays that uh, alert dialog. In addition to that blocks, to those two models, there will be additional runtime libraries that uh, will be uh, uh, a big helper in many, many different cases. So let's, start, let's take a look at the parsing. So parsing JavaScript or parsing any programming language will, is very similar to parsing uh, human language. If someone says jQuery is cool, then your brain will start to deconstruct this sentence into words. Uh, we're lucky because in many Western languages, you can separate words by spaces. And as soon as you get all the stream of words uh, without realizing it, then uh, your brain continue to understand that series of words into something that resembles some meaningful expression. In this case, there are subjects there. There are, there are possible mo more than one subject, but in general, there are grammars as to how people uh, speak or write uh, something. Now, as you can see, there can be cases where there's a list, list of words that you know, you know, doesn't make any sense because it doesn't follow certain rules. Uh, parsing JavaScript is very similar. So we start by the steps that calls uh, tokenization. This is very similar to uh, parsing English. So we first split this uh, one line of code into uh, tokens. Var is a keyword. And you see that identifier is, a, in this case, is answer, and so on and so forth. So we have one, two, three, four, five uh, uh, different tokens there. Now, once we get that, we have to understand the structure of this, uh, this line of code. Oh, by the way, uh, before I continue, spaces uh, are completely ignored. So it doesn't matter whether you have one space or two spaces. These two line of codes produce exactly the same uh, stream of tokens. And this is why in, in the code that, in the tools that uh, minify it or uh, obfuscate your code, all the extra white spaces are removed because it doesn't make any difference as to how the program will be executed. For the JavaScript engine, they will see the, the list of all those tokens. So once we get that, then we'll construct something called a syntax tree. Uh, as any tree, we start from the root. Uh, if you see var answer equals 42, we know that this is variable declaration that particular syntax node needs to additional information, what variable needs to declare, and that is the identifier, and what value we need to assign to that identifier. So this is called identifier and in initializer. This is just one line of code, a uh, simple expression that doesn't do much. But if you have a full-blown program, two lines of code, there's a secondary line that call alert with the, the value of answers. How does the syntax tree look like? It's very similar. We have program as a top level instead of just the uh, var uh, variable declaration. And we have the usual variable declaration um, on the left side. 
and then additional uh, a call expression. Uh, each of these syntax node maps into each of the line of code in that uh, example. Of course, if you have hundreds of them, then the program node can have uh, hundreds of children or child nodes. The variable declaration, it has the same thing as the uh, previous example, and the call expression also needs additional information. What function needs to be called and what values need to be passed to the function, and that's called the identifier and the arguments respectively. So this is the so-called syntax tree. Now, uh, if you are really curious and try to understand how a JavaScript engine uh, produce syntax tree out of your code, then I have an online demo that you can try on sprima.org slash demo slash parse, and I'm gonna show you quickly how it works. So, technically you just put any code you like there. Uh, maybe I'll, uh, And then on the left side, you will see the syntax tree produced by parsing this code, not executing it, just parsing it, um, and then displayed in a, in a visualization format. So you can see that I have a program here, that program has one expression, and that expression is called a call expression, and the function name, or in this case, the callee, uh, has the identifier start with the arguments a string. So you can do a lot of things. You can have answers six times seven, and then alert answer. So we have a bit more complicated uh, example here. The program has two uh, statements. The first one is variable declaration, and the other one is the expression statement, which is the well-known call expression that we've seen. The variable declaration needs to assign a value to the identifier, but in this case, it's not a constant. It's a binary expression, and the binary expression is a multiplication between two uh, numbers, which is six and seven. So you can use this online tools to explore how JavaScript engine will consume your code and parse it and construct the syntax tree. So that's about syntax tree. So now that the, the tree is constructed, obviously the JavaScript engine needs to do something more than that because otherwise it's not very useful for you. Um, so the syntax tree will be passed to the interpreter and the interpreter will uh, uh, interpret the tree and execute something. So the simplest form of interpreter is by just walking the tree. Here's an example. Uh, we have a variable declaration again uh, that assigns the value of the result of a multiplication of two numbers to the variable called answers. That gray box down there uh, serves as the so-called execution context to see what, what happens with that variable. So we start with the variable declaration. Um, it finds the, the identifier's answer and prepare that in the execution context. And the value for that answer comes from a uh, uh, a multiplication, so it goes on to the right side of the tree, find out that, oh, this is a multiply operator, and it needs to pick six and seven, produce the, the outcome, and then put, it, uh, put the result in the uh, variable that we uh, set through the identifier. So read this thread for what? It's just a matter of walking the tree, top to bottom, and then figuring out what to execute uh, for every single syntax node. So uh, this seems to be complicated, but it's actually not, and there's a very nice online demo that allows you to see how your JavaScript code will be executed. So I have a simple example here. It takes uh, the sum of the square of numbers from one to four, and if I run this, then it will highlight each uh, steps that corresponds to each, each syntax node, and in the middle you can see the execution context, or in this case it's called environment, and what happens to those variables. And on the right side is the expression syntax. If you traverse the tree, you can see how deep you are and what are the patterns and the nodes. So it will loop through your uh, for statement and execute uh, the, the body of that loop and take the value of uh, i, in this case, the loop variable, and then square it, and then uh, continue to accumulate in the variable called sum. We can watch this all day long, but you get the idea. It's fun. Okay, now we, we execute the, the, your JavaScript code by walking the tree. Now the big things that might come to your mind is that walking that tree all the time is expensive because you know the tree doesn't change unless you change your code and the step is always the same. 
So you know, if there's a multiplication, we need to multiply it all the time. Uh, one way to optimize this is by turning that tree into a series of bytecodes. It's very similar to many, many other programming environments such as uh, uh, Java or C Sharp. Instead of walking the tree, we're just gonna execute the, the bytecode. So here's the uh, simple hypothetical bytecodes for a stack-based virtual machines that converts that syntax tree, uh, the example that I've, gen I've given before, into uh, four bytecodes. Uh, so push technically just means take the number and put it into the stack, and then multiply takes two numbers from the stack, multiply it and push the, the result of the stack, and then set local means take that value uh, the topmost of the stack and then put it in the local variable, and we use index there, uh, uh, the zeroth variable. Once it gets into uh, virtual machines, or in this case, uh, bytecode, we don't really use identifier name anymore because it's already encoded in the symbol table. So let's walk through this. So this is the bytecode, and this is, imagine this is the stack. It could start from anywhere. I'll start from um, index 10, and then all the local variables. Let's assume there are other local variables as well. So you push six to the stack, and then you push seven to the stack, and then multiply will take six and seven, multiply it, and then push the values to the stack. Uh, of course, it remove uh, six and seven. And then so set local will take that and put it in uh, the, the index of the local variables, which maps to the variables called answer. So executing this bytecode is really fast because there's no need to uh, walk the, 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 the entire syntax tree anymore. The JavaScript virtual machine just needs to take the next bytecode and perform the necessary operation. Um, so if you look at this example, uh, you might see that, well, all the time it needs to multiply six and seven. So it's kind of like uh, useless to do it for every single uh, time because we know that the answer is constant. So there's tons of optimization that a JavaScript virtual machine will do, and one of them is the so-called constant folding. So when, when it sees that, well, I need to push six to the stack and push seven and then multiply them together, that's a constant. That doesn't need to change from one execution to another. If you call this function and this line of code again, the result will be still 42 no matter how many times you execute it. So uh, once it scans the list of uh, bytecodes, then it can find out that, oh, actually I don't need to uh, take six, take seven, multiply that runtime and push it to the stack. All I need to do is always push 42 to the stack. This is, this is called uh, an optimization step, and this is done once at the beginning before the virtual machine execute your bytecode. Uh, so in other words, it's as if you write this line of code as opposed to that one. Uh, and this is one, one, just one of the many, many different optimization that uh, today's JavaScript engine could do. In other words, uh, if you think that you can uh, optimize your code by manually folding all the constant, sometimes it's not necessary anymore. And this is the, the usual performance advice these days. Some best practices that you've read from some guides five years ago, some six, year ago, six years ago, might not apply to today's JavaScript engine because the technology has changed and today's engine can optimize certain things that otherwise you will optimize by hand. In other words, don't worry about little things like caching the variable, uh, the array length, and then do magic things with string and this and that, because most of the time, if you can figure out how to optimize that by hand, modern JavaScript engine could also do it automatically for you. And you keep your uh, source code to be quite readable. So an even more speed up that we could do is not to uh, execute the bytecodes, but execute machine code. And this is something that's very uh, popular in modern JavaScript optimization. Instead of walking the syntax tree, now we run the bytecode, and after a certain time, that bytecode is transformed into the machine code, so that the CPU can execute it directly. And this is the step that is called uh, just-in-time compilation. It's called just-in-time because usually those bytecodes are turned into machine code when, when it's really, really needed. Uh, for example, if you have a, a handler for, for a button, uh, when someone click on some button, and it's executed, executed once, say to submit the form, there's no really need to compile this into machine code. It's just a waste of time and effort and memory. However, if there are certain loops and certain things that you will uh, otherwise want to be executed really fast, then uh, a, JavaScript en a modern JavaScript engine will be quite smart and decide, oh, this loop is hot, uh, quote, quote and it needs, to be, it needs to run really fast and turn it into machine code that, so that the CPU, CPU can execute that directly. Uh, in addition to 
the parser and the interpreter, in many cases, uh, or in, in, in all cases, uh, our JavaScript environment also comes up with, comes with uh, some additional libraries. I'm sure you've seen all these uh, built-in objects as part of the um, JavaScript standards. Um, let's take a look at one particular function, uh, trim. I know that's a bad example because Dave mentioned that trim has some, some bugs in, uh, in, some, in some browser and, and engines. Uh, if you have a string and you, have, you want to remove the leading and trailing spaces, you could use this complicated regular expression. Uh, it does the job. It should be extremely fast, especially for a short regular expression like this. However, it doesn't really say what it does. And it's hard to debug. And the next person that uh, take a look at your code might stumble and uh, be wondering what it is that you would like to do here. And that's why trim exists, because instead of doing that fancy regular expression, you can just call trim. And one just needs to take a look at the API documentation of trim to realize what trim does. Now, there are other functions within uh, JavaScript standard objects that allows you to do uh, different things. Taking, uh, computing the sine or cosine for a number, for example. Yes, you could expand that and then do a Taylor approximation, but why bother just call uh, the uh, standard math libraries to perform that operation. So that's, about, that's all about JavaScript engines. It consumes your code, uh, turn it into syntax tree, convert into bytecodes, potentially convert it into machine code with, with its JIT compiler, and then run it in its interpreter, and it can receive some additional function from the standard runtime libraries and objects. Now, how do, how do we integrate that with the browser? Uh, this is very important because you can, you can do a lot of things in JavaScript, but if there's no way to uh, extract that result and present it to the users or accept user interaction and perform something with it, then it's pretty useless. Um, prior to the existence of Node.js, many of us probably do not realize that JavaScript engine exists in the browser. Uh, if you look at this table, the popular browsers there, usually we know the name of the browser, but we don't really know the name of the JavaScript engines that that is associated with individual browser. Uh, since browser is very important and talking about browser integration can be boring, uh, let me take a detour and explain a little bit about the, uh, the amazing story of browser names and why it's, uh, it's, it's close to home. So back in the days, Mosaic is probably uh, was the first browser that is credited to uh, uh, popularize the World Wide Web. It's uh, created by NCSA, National Computing, National Center for uh, Supercomputing Application. Uh, it's not NSA, it's NCSA. Um, and it's uh, from here, University of Illinois. So uh, some, some engineers there decided that, oh, we could totally productize and monetize this browser and uh, decided to form a company. Uh, one of them is uh, Mark Anderson, also a graduate of University of Illinois. Uh, at the beginning, it's called Mosaic Communication, but the similarity with the name Mosaic might cause some problems, so they changed it to Netscape Communication Corporation, and uh, it went on to produce one of the most popular browsers, at least back in the days, Netscape Navigator. Now, many of you don't realize this, but there's an official spin-off from uh, NCSA, uh, which uh, transferred its intellectual property to Spyglass and produced the browser called Spyglass Mosaic. Spyglass uh, licensed their browser technology to hundreds of companies, and one of them is, anyone can guess? Microsoft. Internet Explorer 1 uh, and 2 technically were based on Mosaic source code. If you don't believe me, open Microsoft Internet Explorer about dialog, and you'll see the reference to NCSA and Mosaic. So this is one family of browser, and of course, uh, anyone remembers the browser 1? Uh, browser War version one uh, back in the late 90s. Netscape went on to open source their browser and call it uh, Mozilla. Uh, Mozilla is even uh, a, a nice play on uh, a Mosaic. Has anyone here watched Muhammad Ali versus Smoking Joe? Thrilla in Manila? Mo yeah, Mozilla was supposed to be that reference. Mosaic killer. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the remote distant uh, Europe, a bunch of KD hackers decided that, well, Mozilla wasn't really the browser that we wanted. It's, it doesn't integrate very well with the desktop environment. Anyone here use KDE? 10 years ago, five years ago, yes. And decided to create their own uh, browser engine. 
the JavaScript engine is called KJS, and the rendering engine is called KHTML. And this went on to become uh, a popular browser back in the days for uh, KDE users. Uh, it's called Conqueror. In the very nice Cicerone choice of names, because once you navigate certain part of the world, and then of course to navigate certain part of the world, you need, you need Spyglass, and you explore that part, and obviously after that you'll conquer it. Take a look at the bold words there and uh, see the similarities and the choice of names in the exploration theme. So KHTML and KGS become something that Apple adopted for its uh, rendering engine. Very popular, everyone knows about WebKit. And WebKit went on to power the, uh, one of the most popular browsers in the world, uh, Safari. Runs on many, many different uh, desktop and uh, mobile environment. So little we know that uh, KDE technologies at the end of the day powers uh, millions of browsers that, that, that are being used by many of us through our smartphones. So when you concur a LAN, then you can take Safari there. So this choice of word is very interesting. In fact, if you take a look at the Safari's uh, WebKit source code, uh, when Apple took KHTML and then uh, released it internally, the branch itself is called Alexander, uh, after Alexander the Great Conqueror. Enough about browser names. So the JavaScript engine is hidden inside the browser. And of course, besides just the, 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 the JavaScript engine, the browser needs to deal with a lot of things. It has network stack because it needs to pull bits and pieces from the server. It has a graphic stack because it needs to display your web page as pixels on the screen. And among others, it has a document object model that represents the way your document is structured, your HTML document. So uh, the, the your JavaScript code needs to interact with DOM because otherwise it's pretty useless. And this is done through something called binding. Um, let's take a look at the, 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 the funny thing about JavaScript. Uh, if you learn many programming languages, uh, usually there's something called print or puts in, in, in Ruby, which takes something and then display it to the screen. It's been the case for basic. It's been the case for Python. Now, however, if you go to the browser and uh, type print in the console, what do you think you will get? Nobody ever tried this? It won't display your string to the screen. It will open a print dialog. Uh, now you may say, Aria, a browser is a browser. It doesn't need to display something to the screen because it doesn't have console and so on. Why don't we try it on the JavaScript shell? Why don't we pick node and then type print something? And of course, it will complain. Reference error, print is not defined. So as crazy it may sound, but print doesn't exist in JavaScript world. It's not even part of the standard library. And if we, if we actually run print, what it does is to call the print function of the window object, because the uh, window is the global object that runs your, uh, that encloses your code. Uh, same thing, if you call alert, technically it's called window.alert. So it doesn't call uh, built-in function which technically doesn't exist and pass the arguments. Um, and window is really even specific to the browser. If you try to type window in node, it will complain again, window is not defined because window is not uh, part of JavaScript. So all these fancy things with console, window, document, it doesn't necessarily part of JavaScript. It doesn't even exist. It doesn't get mentioned in the ECMAScript specification. Those are the additional objects that are injected by the browser into the JavaScript engine because it needs to interact with the, with the DOM and with other parts of the browser. And to explain that, the easiest way is to take a, a, an, an analogy with, the, <laughs> with the, this fancy video from uh, NSYNC some time ago. I, I, don't, I hope I don't embarrass myself here. So why is that? Why, why, what is very similar to this? It's because when you manipulate that the puppets or marionette, uh, technically, you live in two different worlds, yourself as the puppet master or the manipulator and the puppet that lives in its own world. So it's one object, it's the same object, but it lives in two different worlds. The uh, dark block there represents something that happens in the native world, uh, and then the, the other light uh, gray box represents something that runs in your JavaScript world. So when the browser creates and inject a window object, what it does, it tells JavaScript engine, please create this shadow proxy object called window, but it doesn't do anything in the JavaScript world. 
it has one-to-one -one mapping into the instance of the window object in the native world. So when you call window alert, what it does is it doesn't do anything in, in the, inside the JavaScript world. It calls that function with that argument. The argument is transplanted all the way to the uh, corresponding uh, version in the uh, native world, and therefore in that uh, native world, it will start to, to open the dialog that you know, shows the value that you pass there. So it's really uh, one object, two different world, JavaScript, and the native world. And the same thing if you need some user interaction. For example, if you want to prompt for uh, your usernames, if you call prompt, then again, it will call prompt uh, with the, the right message, send it all the way to the native world, the native world will open the dialog, ask the user for their names, and when you type uh, OK there, it will send back the result all the way to the JavaScript world. So there's nothing really happens in the JavaScript world within the JavaScript engine, within the browser. It just interacts with the native world. Um, so we, we talk about uh, prom and alert, which, which is really simple uh, function invocation. But this binding can have a very complicated synchronous object model uh, where, for example, document exists uh, as the property of window, but document really maps to the real document object model that you have uh, in your browser, which is the structural representation of your HTML content. So if you say document.title equals something, then it, it will go ahead and then set the title of that, the title property of, that, of your document object model, and then it will show up as the actual uh, window title or uh, browser, uh, application title of the browser. And the same thing, if you try to uh, read the property that live in the native world, it goes back uh, to your JavaScript world as well. Uh, and it, it still applies to jQuery. If you do this kind of uh, ex, uh, DOM manipulation, then it will still go to jQuery library, as you can see from this breakpoint. At one point, it will call this dot uh, text content equals your string. And this here, in that particular line of code, refers to the, uh, the object. Um, the HTML div element or paragraph or whatever object that has the, that particular ID. And that object, again, has two uh, versions, the one that lives in the JavaScript world and the one that lives in your DOM. So when you take the property, when you set the, proper, the value of the property, it will go uh, to the native world and set that value. When you try to read it, uh, the same thing happens, but in the other direction. So there's one-to-one -one mapping between uh, all the object that lives in your JavaScript world all the uh, structural representation of your DOM with the actual DOM that lives in the native world of the browser. So uh, we cover, uh, we went a little bit under the hood and uh, uh, I've seen how JavaScript, and JavaScript code gets executed. Uh, there's a parser component there. It gets passed into the interpreter to execute it and there's additional libraries and object, object bindings allows a browser to inject additional uh, proxy object into your JavaScript world so you can manipulate something outside the world. Hopefully this is a useful information for you and you use it uh, for good use. Yeah, have fun trying to figure out all the wrong thing about this poster. Right, thank you very much. Where's Dave? Do I have time for questions? Or does anyone have any question at all? All right, I'll take a sit no. So enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.